welcome. Uh, I expected that football is more popular in Goa than the crowd here today. But anyway, on a Sunday morning, it's uh, rather difficult. But uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I have known Suki just for actually not for too long, but we have had a lot of interactions. And I really find that there are very few people in the world who make their passion into a profession. And he's one of them, and that's why I feel all the time he's very happy and uh, full of joy. Uh, well, I'm not exactly a football fan, but I'm in general interested in everything. But I must narrate this small anecdote. When I was once invited for a match between Rotterdam and uh, uh, AFS Amsterdam, and uh, I just went because I was invited, and I was picked up in a bus, which was like a living room, and I landed there. And then after five minutes, there was a teenage girl who was the owner's daughter uh, who had invited me. And she started saying, Matnia, do it, do it. Uh, took the goal, and after five minutes, I found myself standing on the top of this uh, table and again asking Matthias, come on, do it, man. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, that's how, that's my f uh, actually first major match I saw in my life. Uh, well, Suki hates the uh, Goa Vedanta Football Academy, Shaita Football Academy, and he has huge plans for Goa. He has given a lot of thought to the football situation in Goa, and uh, he's really wanting to take football in Goa ahead so that we can produce a lot of important players, not only for the national but also international level. And uh, I could see his passion. Uh, interestingly, the f football was brought into Goa, uh, I would claim, because of Napoleon Bonaparte. You would perhaps be surprised why Napoleon is connected with football. Football, as you know, is an English game. And in 1799 till 1812, there was 10,000 British soldiers stationed in Goa to protect Goa from a possible Napoleonic invasion. And so they were in Cabo Fort, Fort Cabo, and they were the first footballers of Goa. It is not the Portuguese who brought football to Goa, it was the British. And according to records, there was a prince called William Leon who started the Arpora School. And that was the first football club, according to whatever little research I have done. And he started the first football club. And interestingly, this was the first English medium school in Goa. And the vice president of Mozambique has studied there. Because a lot of Goans who were settled in Africa would come here. And there were lots of uh, I mean, football clubs also eventually then in uh, Africa, the Goans started their own football club. So well, uh, without much more ado, let me uh, request uh, Sukinder to enlighten us about football. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking uh, your time out on uh, uh, Sunday, and that too while it's uh, raining outside. I know it takes a bit of effort, but again, another thing that I'm just assuming is that everybody in this room uh, has some bit of passion, some bit of connection, some bit of liking for the world's best game, the beautiful game, which is called football. And uh, thank you, madam, coming all the way from where you come from, uh, Jharkhand. Anybody from outside uh, Goa, uh, or where are you coming from? Assam, fantastic. Uh, and, and just to get an understanding, uh, uh, so uh, wh what are the kind of areas uh, of specialization do we come from? So I've met uh, the gentleman who's a writer, I've met a media professional, uh, and then anybody from the business side? Anybody from more of a? We, we have a, we have a shop still in the Goa Football Factory. Of course. Congratulations. It's a, it's a great initiative, and I, I keep reading about it. It's great. Uh, before I start, um, uh, again, you know, the whole idea was to get a little understanding of who the participants are. Uh, yes, I definitely not, I, I'm not as seasoned a speaker as Dr. Kerker, but I, I speak from my heart. I tell a lot of stories, and I just wanted to make sure that these stories are relevant. Now, added pressure from your side, baby. I have to make sure that I have to keep her engaged, and we will do that. Uh, Dr. Gekar obviously gave a little bit of background. Yes, I, I am uh, very, very fortunate to be uh, you know, in this particular uh, situation where my passion has been converted into uh, my profession. And uh, uh, apart from the love for football, I have a big, big love for uh, another 
big, big emotion that I have. If you see the flag, I'm very, very, very passionate about my country. Uh, and uh, I think, again, in a very good situation where in whatever little way uh, I could contribute to uh, the nation. And uh, maybe if football is a kind of platform, if football is a kind of tool uh, that will help me to glorify my nation a little more, uh, we will try to do that. Uh, uh, thankfully, uh, why I'm also in, a, in, in this position talking to you about uh, uh, football uh, is also uh, because of the experiences that I've been able to gather over a period of time. Uh, I had the fortune of working with one of the best sports brand in the world, which is called Nike. And that too, in a situation where they were looking at India uh, from a new perspective. And that's the period where you really understand what, it, what the brand stands for, uh, what are the ethos of the brand? What's really the vision for the brand? And I've experienced that. So that was a very, very fortunate part of my life. Moving on, uh, it was a very unusual career decision where I wanted to jump a little deeper into what this football sport is all about. Uh, I was young, uh, definitely inexperienced, definitely not as educated. Uh, so th there's this organization called All India Football Federation, equivalent of BCCI for football. And uh, that organization is uh, responsible for managing uh, football in the country and developing the sport. Uh, three years with them, and uh, I realized that we are sitting on a gold mine. There's a lot of passion, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of kids. Uh, the young generation definitely is excited about sport, but maybe we've not done enough. So in our own way, uh, using marketing as one of the areas uh, to bring in some bit of change, I, I did certain things that I could. Um, there, there was an era where um, the, the whole uh, sentiment of startup uh, and the whole uh, sentiment of entrepreneurship uh, had come into India. I'm talking about 2008 to 2012. Around that area, there was an ambitious, pro ambitious uh, project where uh, uh, a few investors in Chicago were looking at. They wanted to develop football business in uh, India, along with a country like uh, Japan in Asia, where football definitely was a lot more evolved. The idea was, can we go into a new market? Can we go into a new uh, country, uh, an evolving uh, footballing country, and create a business? Uh, business definitely was a bad word uh, in 2010. Uh, you did football only for passion. You did football only for charity. You did football only for philanthropy. Uh, that definitely was a bit of a difficult decision for us to step out and say, you know what, we do believe resources, investments, sponsorship, and business is important. Uh, so over a period of five years, we established a couple of concepts, which included football consultancy as well as player presentation. And uh, very glad to uh, tell you that uh, the, the, the Liverpool project back in Pune is something that definitely is one of my favorite projects that we were able to execute at that point of time. Uh, then uh, Goa uh, was, again, uh, you know, part of the fortunate experiences that I've been having with football uh, happened in 2015, FC Goa. I think it's no longer a club, it's become a cult. Uh, I, I came and experienced uh, FC Goa. Uh, initially, I was looking at, I was telling Dr. Kerika, initially I was looking at Goa as a football market, uh, FC Goa as an opportunity to leverage, monetize, uh, commercialize everything that we wanted to do, and that definitely was my job. Uh, a couple of months into Goa and uh, connecting with a lot of Goan football stakeholders, and especially the fans. I met a two-year-old uh, boy. Uh, his name was uh, Daniel, and his father, Dean, uh, put certain posts out on uh, social media, and I connected with him and wanted to make sure that my youngest fan had a great experience in the stadium. When I met him for the first time, he sang the entire FC Goa, Forza Goa anthem for me. Uh, that night, I went back and told my wife, you know what, uh, while FC Goa, Goa is an opportunity, I think it's become a responsibility today. Just to make sure that these kids, the ladies, the girls, as well as the fans, uh, who definitely were the best fans as compared to any other state, uh, they deserve a lot more. So while we do whatever we need to do to sustain the club, make sure it's, uh, from a business point of view, it, it runs well, uh, we have a massive, massive responsibility to make sure that the sentiments of the fans uh, that exist, we are giving them the due respect, especially the young generation. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, the, the story of my professional life, uh, which obviously gets a lot mixed up with my passion. Uh, and here I am, 
uh, as uh, Dr. Kerka said, uh, uh, the, 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 the project that I'm overseeing right now is uh, uh, a project for Vedanta Resources. Again, a massive $12 billion company uh, committed to do a lot for the communities. And one of the platforms that we've chosen to create some bit of community connect and community development uh, is football. Uh, there's an academy that's been running for last uh, 18 years. It's called Saisa Football Academy. Uh, it was there as a, as a big commitment to the Goan youth uh, and the Goan fo football players. Now we are taking the idea to various parts of the country. We just recruited two kids from uh, Zambia where we have our operations. The whole idea is that while 50% of the focus essentially will remain on grooming and developing the Goan talent, we need to bring in some bit of competitiveness and we need to make sure that everywhere where we are present, we offer uh, to the communities, to the players uh, across the world a great uh, infrastructure that we have created already in Goa. So that's something that I, I manage now. But very, very uh, uh, specific to youth development, grassroots, community development. And over a period of three to four years, we want to create a big pathway, which could be a club, which could be uh, a team. Uh, we, we're still kind of developing that particular model. Any questions so far? Any, any particular pointers which I need to be aware of? Any particular interest that you might have? Any, any particular uh, person might have? Uh, okay, so I'll run through it. Uh, but again, uh, just, just wanted to uh, specify it right here. Uh, I, you know, it's also a part of learning uh, for me to kind of spend this one hour here. Uh, if there's any question, query, thought, uh, idea, uh, please shoot it out immediately. It's fresh and we can immediately address it. Yeah. So as I said, uh, for me, very, very uh, important is not only uh, the football piece of it, but also the, the flag that, that's right there. There's a growing number of kids who are, if they are not finding the relevant opportunity in their respective states, they are going abroad. I've seen, seen so many programs uh, which, which uh, are actually coaching kids from our country in various parts of the world. Uh, is that right, wrong, technical, non-technical? I don't want to get into it. But this aspiration is driving not only the kids, but also the parents to support the footballing dreams. So I'll leave it at that. We can talk a little more about that. Uh, coolness quotient, definitely, Cricket has become my dad's game, and football is my game. Cricket is becoming a little more of a long stretch for this young generation, which is driven by the whole passion that has been created by the EPLs, the La Ligas, the, the World Cups, and all that. Uh, so, which again comes back to all their discussions in the school, in, with the friends, with the peers, about how cool football is. So that's kind of helping me. Uh, they definitely are following uh, football, uh, either in term, terms of uh, live telecast or, or uh, following the game in general. They are participating a lot more. At the school level, I definitely have seen increase and spike in, in the participation level. Uh, and which definitely is actual participation or passive participation. We've heard about the success of these video games, um, uh, you know, the FIFA 17 or whatever it might be. Uh, the involvement of these kids in concepts around football is going up and up. So that essentially is bringing a lot more of younger population into football and the football industry. Uh, so my, my, my point uh, over here essentially was to highlight that this younger generation essentially has got a lot more affinity towards football. So that definitely has changed from 2007 to 2017. And uh, how do we harness it? Is, is where I am a lot more concentrating on the active participation. If they have the interest, if they have the dreams, let them realize it. Let them come onto the ground, let them participate, and let them play. Uh, easier said than done, but what you require definitely is infrastructure, right kind of experts, right kind of technical capability. I do keep on uh, telling a lot of coaches uh, that no coaching is uh, better than bad coaching. Uh, and that essentially is something that I'm very passionate about. I do believe coaching education, coaching development is, is a serious, serious uh, area that we need to look at. And uh, even if we get a lot more participation and if we are not doing uh, adequately enough about it, it's, it's a big, big concern that I might have. So a little, little more on the administration side of it. Uh, 2007 is when uh, the All India Football Federation in real sense became professional. How? Prior to that, uh, the headquarters for All India Football Federation used to operate from the same location 
where the general secretary used to uh, reside. And uh, one gentleman which, whose name is Alberto Colasso uh, was the guy who uh, saw that entire trans transition. He used to operate from a small room in Fatorda till the time FIFA came in and said, listen, India, China are huge, huge focus for us and we definitely want you to organize yourself better. And that will start with a proper, proper administrative organization. So why don't you move out of this small little corner in this particular stadium to a location like Delhi? And Delhi definitely is the center for a lot of activities, a lot of systems. So the whole push essentially was to spend a million dollar to create a football house, put it in Dwarka, and get people in to, to start professionally running it. Uh, so that happened in 2007. Uh, over a period of uh, time, I think um, at that time, I do remember uh, the total staff strength of that particular office was about 10 to 12. And again, the nature of staffing essentially was based on a lot more passion, a lot more of experience uh, rather than professionalism. And which definitely has changed now. Uh, the count as of now is about 55 in various departments. And my excitement levels are around departments which are focusing on coaching, departments which are focusing on grassroots. They have four people working only on grassroots projects. There are licenses, uh, coaching licenses, that are being promoted and uh, executed all across the country. So that essentially is going on, and a team of about five people is trying to organize all of that. A long way to go, while the resources have tripled from what uh, the Federation had in 2007, uh, the number of projects definitely have become uh, bigger. Uh, and even when, when you speak about the scope of the project, the under 17 FIFA World Cup is as big as it can get for our country. After all, it's a World Cup, even if it's at, at a youth level. So from a 2007, when I was not even dreaming of an Asian competition in my country, what I've got in 2017 is a world level FIFA event. So I'm happy about that. Uh, now, going further, what do we kind of really do with what we've created for ourselves is harness that op opportunity, bring in the industry into it. I do believe the Federation has the responsibility not only to look at the technical side, but do a lot more on the confi confidence side uh, amongst the public as well as the industry at large, and make sure that the sport in the country is better represented. Uh, the current uh, president for all the uh, All India Football Federation, and again, he is a part of a lot of controversies, but I do believe uh, he has uh, brought in certain bit of change, and he is capable in his position as the vice president of uh, Asian Football Confederation, as well as having some bit of legal representation in the FIFA uh, legal committee, uh, is his well positioned to do that. So what do we do after the 2017 World Cup? What is the legacy plan that we start kind of working on? And what is the kind of uh, leverage that we create out of what we've uh, experienced in the last 10 years? So that's where my, uh, my expectation from the administration would be to better represent uh, football uh, and uh, India at the global level and bring the industry a lot more. And that's going to happen only when you bring in a lot more confidence. Uh, are we okay so far? Uh, Technical side, and uh, yeah, there are quite a few people. So just jump in, just throw any any kind of remark, any kind of questions you might have. What I've experienced uh, with Bob Houghton, and I had the fortune of working with uh, this gentleman very, very closely. Uh, he had a purpose of getting into the 2011 uh, Asian Cup. And this, by the way, happened after 24 years. After 24 years, uh, we qualified for the elite Asian Championship which happened in Qatar in 2011. Uh, so he did what he had to do uh, fantastically well. And that was a time, I do believe, uh, while the whole professionalization wave was uh, being followed from 2000 onwards, we had something to talk about at the national team success level. And that is what Bob Houghton era did to us. 2012, the orientation changed. Uh, we, uh, there, there was a belief that uh, to, football definitely couldn't be built uh, on, on a short-term uh, short plan. So let's get in somebody uh, who, who has more of a technical direction kind of approach and a coach who is able to implement 
the, the, the vision of the technical director. The technical director happened to be a gentleman called Robert Barn, and his previous engagement was with the Australian Football Federation as the technical director. Great experience, he came in and put together a project, a vision document, by the way, called Laksha, Laksha 2022. And uh, this is where uh, Wim Koermans, again a very accomplished uh, Dutch uh, coach, came in and tried to implement whatever. Again, my experience is uh, the way uh, the, the whole development was envisioned, I do not believe it went the same way. Uh, and and a couple of couple of reasons for that again, which which came from him himself, was it it was more of a cultural change and an ideology change that we were trying to bring in to set certain things the Dutch way, which is starting off with six year old to about twenty year old uh, kind of program. Uh, but somewhere or the other, when uh, Wim was trying to handle a group of boys in the national team who were already uh, in the age bracket of twenty twenty four. Uh, he was not able to get the best out of them. The only reason probably is Wim should have gotten those boys 10 years ago rather than now. So the whole philosophy change did, did not kind of get us any kind of positive results. We got, got decent results uh, once in a while. We beat the Cameroon B team in the Nehru Cup finals and that was a big win. But somehow at a consistent level, uh, because of some bit of fragmentation in terms of the vision of the club, where the players were playing regularly, to what the national team wanted to achieve, I think that definitely didn't come together. And again, it's a team sport. Uh, it's a team uh, sport that not only requires uh, teamwork on the pitch, but outside the pitch. I think somewhere or the other, it, it didn't work out very, very well. Having said that, I think Wim did what he uh, could do. And uh, come 2015, uh, we saw a reintroduction of uh, Stephen Constantine. Stephen uh, was the coach of the national team till about 2005 before he decided to move on, get a lot more experiences uh, in countries, uh, particularly in Africa. And he helped Rwanda a lot uh, by, by bringing them into, into the top uh, ranked uh, teams in, in, uh, in the world. Uh, and from 2017, uh, what we experienced is, is uh, a consistent uh, growth uh, in, in the way the team is playing, the way the team is feeling, and ultimately is getting reflected on the rankings as well. Today we stand at 100. Uh, what next? 2026, uh, a, a possible target top 50 uh, in, in, in uh, the world. But more importantly, more importantly, being top 50 in the world is not going to get us World Cup qualification. We need to be the top eight best countries in, uh, in 2026 to be able to qualify for the World Cup. That's where my expectation at the Asian circuit, can we get into the top eight? Obviously, there's this series of qualifiers, but uh, we, we need to be competitive and then be at the top uh, eight. Uh, obviously, there was a gentleman who did talk about when are we going to hit that 50. I think reasonably, 2023 is something that we need to aim and achieve, and definitely very possible. Can I ask anybody what team you are We are 15th right now. And that essentially is the that is a lot easier uh, in, in the World Cup qualification. Yes, Imagine, please. for example, if the yes, Chinese please. have invested $50 billion into their grassroots system, they're not expecting to be in the World Cup qualifiers by 2052. India have invested very little compared to that. So how are we ever going to get into that sort of level? And we, we, you've mentioned a lot of things. The culture needs to be, and women's science to offer infrastructure. And I, I think at 2023, that's very, very uh, optimistic. Definitely, Everybody. definitely. And I would like to admit that I'm a very, 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 very optimistic guy. Uh, and again, it's an ambition. Uh, you're right. It's an ambition that I definitely am, am, uh, am having uh, at, at uh, the current level. Um, also, g going a little deeper into why I do believe I've seen the under-17 India team play. Unfortunate that there were certain series of events that definitely shouldn't have happened. But having said that, I've seen players who, if they are kept together, groomed well, uh, given the best in the, in, the, in, the, in the world to perform, I think that 2023 uh, qualifier would look a lot more interesting for me. I don't know where it would go. I'm not really a technical guy. But I do believe if the same group is given the task, along with the coaching uh, department, to make sure that we are hitting that top eight consistently, I, I, and I want a bit of luck. Uh, in 2011, the qualification for the Asian Cup had a bit of uh, everything in it for me, including luck. 
and I, I do believe the luck will favor the brave, and, and I'm acting, trying to act brave right now. So, in so that play, yeah. are you promoting football or are you promoting a football team? Uh, good question, sir. I think it has to happen simultaneously. So Yes, sir. Tell me how many academics have we established? I'm coming to that, sir. I, I'm, I'm coming to that, sir. Okay. I'm coming to that, sir. Uh, you're right, sir. Why I keep on going back to the technical side as well as the national team side is essentially because it is going to profile uh, the sport the way it should be and bring in a lot more enthusiasm and participation. But I'll, I'll come to the come to the uh, youth development and grassroots side. This is what it is, sir. Uh, without the base of the pyramid, definitely. You, you cannot expect the youth development, the academies, or the elite level football to stand. Uh, and this is where, right from the age group of about 6 to 12, I do believe there needs to be enough of grassroots level engagement, uh, the right kind of academies who are focusing on uh, grassroots, and some bit of youth training to go with that. When I'm, when I'm indicating all these areas, sir, my assumption and my hope is that it is of a standardized form. It is of a very, very good level. I'm not really, really looking at just uh, executing a coaching program, but a very effective uh, coaching program. Uh, so the focus definitely has to be a lot more of engagement, learning, and fun till about 12. And that's the age then you, you start focusing a little more in terms of identification of certain traits, uh, in terms of physical, in terms of tactical, as well as uh, uh, psychological, to identify the next generation of uh, football players who can take the game seriously from about 12 to about 16, 17. And these are the players who need a lot more attention in form of academies. Uh, uh, sir, you, 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 you uh, spoke about the number of academies. 2007, as per my... 2007 to 2017. 2007. And how many are planned from 2017 to 2027? Right. So what has happened, really? What has happened, really? Uh, in 2007... Uh, if you had to think about the best of the academies in the country, there were two names that were coming to everybody's mind. One was Tata Football Academy, if everybody agrees. And to an extent, Chandigarh Football Academy, because it definitely was one of a government kind of funded project. Sadly, though we had Mohan Bagan, East Bengal, and I've physically been there, uh, even clubs like these, historical and heritage clubs, didn't have the academies. If you come back to Goa, 2007 I'm talking about, while uh, the Goan clubs had a budget of about 7 to 10 crores for uh, their, their first team, unfortunately, not a single club had a residential academy. Are we on the same page? So, 2007, and again, it, it's not really a criticism. The fact was that I am passionate about football, I am investing in football, and that's the reason I have a team. But is there any pathway? Is there any promise? Is there any plan for me to develop an academy? I've spoken to Mohan Bagan East Bengal in 2007-2008. You are such a big club. Why don't you have uh, under 15 regular program? Why don't you have under 18 regular program? Yes, I would have that. But where do I play? I didn't have the competition to go out and play. Then there's no point maintaining and spending on a, this thing. So what do you do? You go to a Tata Football Academy, recruit, buy, and sustain. So that was the scenario. Now what has happened in 2015 to 2017? If you heard about newer clubs, uh, we definitely have uh, seen uh, JCT, uh, Mahindra United, uh, and very, very recently, sadly, uh, uh, Dempo's and Silka Ogre's withdrawing uh, from the I-League. But uh, over a period of last four years, I've seen newer groups coming in. When I think about academies today, I do think about Tata Football Academy, but not as much. Why? Because the reliance on Tata Football Academy to acquire talent has gone. And why? Because I've started producing my own players from my own communities. The best academy, what I see today, is an academy called DSK Liverpool International Football Academy in terms of infrastructure. Go ahead. Can I say they're in severe financial difficulty at this present time? They are, they are. And that, that's I'm obviously... I'm sure that they're going to go ahead. But yes. As the gentleman said, what's the contingency plans to go forward from that? Right. You know, because we had these new old fandangled great academies coming in, and then within two years, kaput. 
Right. So, so that definitely is a business, and you know, businesses have their ups and downs, and unfortunately. Uh, but having said that, if you look at the infrastructure side, if you look at Bengaluru FC, what they've created in Vijayanagar is fantastic, and I do believe in their powers to sustain that particular academy. Uh, you heard of Minerva uh, in Punjab, in Chand uh, Chandigarh. That academy has already created uh, close to eight national team players, four at the junior level, and uh, four now are kind of. Uh, playing, including Sandesh uh, Jingan, and uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, the the senior team. So, so you have newer names kind of coming up. Uh, what is happening to us for that matter? The ambitions have become a little broader. So, while we have the resources and we used to do whatever we used to do, we want to do it better. So, uh, now again, realizing what Pune FC did in 2005 to the league and to the country was a big, big, big favor. They started creating their own players. And it became the first academy to transfer a player at a value of 25 lakhs from their uh, setup to a, a club in Calcutta, which was called United Sports Club. So the reliance on a Tata Football Academy in 2007, which was so heavy, has reduced because the clubs have started doing their own bit. Now, where do I see it going, sir, uh, specifically to your question? I do believe everybody has realized, including the ISL clubs, including the I-League clubs, that you cannot run a football project without investment on grassroots. And that essentially is going to happen. My expectation in that particular process is that while you are investing, uh, you know, 50 on, on managing your first team, invest another 30 uh, essentially to create a very, very sound and a sustainable this thing. Easier said than done. You do that only when you have uh, clarity and you have predictability for next 10 years. Because the players you are going to coach today who are eight, nine, are going to, are going to give you results uh, maybe 10 years later. And the clubs are ready to do that, provided even the league, be the ISL, be the I-League, the second division, or the state league, has some bit of predictability, has some bit of plan. Uh, and this is where my interest from an industry perspective is that we start creating a unified vision. So again, as I said, the base of the pyramid, grassroots, and also, uh, just just very important. Yeah. One sec, one, one sec, one sec. Yeah. So, so also very important to mention that uh, it it is not only about creating players. When you connect with the community through grassroots, it's creating fans, and these are the fans who are going to consume uh, your products, your services, your tickets, your merchandise, everything. And today, uh, even even the atmosphere that you are able to create in in the stadium is not essentially because of one ad that you put out in paper or a TV. It essentially is going to be because of the community work that you've done. Varun? Yeah. Oh, good to see you, by the way, Varun. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, uh, the customer is very important, but uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's community based. Definitely. And uh, even as you go on, the first few years, it was community based. Definitely. But then you move on and lost your flaws. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't say that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they lost uh, the community. Agreed, Varun. Uh, ca ca can't agree more, Varun, because it's not about saving cost from a business point of view. It's about generating yeah. revenues also. Yeah. Uh, just give an example. Uh, it was uh, three years back, uh, Varun. If you remember, Chukudi Chukuwama. Yeah. He was a, uh, a player in Sesa Football Academy. His father was a coach, Clifford Chukuwama. And uh, he trained with the academy for about four to five years. The academy invested uh, in his training and everything. And uh, two, uh, I, I think uh, three years back, he got picked up by a Czech Republic club in the first division, and that brought in a revenue of about 30,000 euros in one go, and the next transfer essentially is going to get the academy about 25% uh, of that transfer fee. So you're right, it's not only about cost saving, it's not only about uh, getting revenues out, 
it's a long process though. Let's let's not kind of kid ourselves. Uh, having said that, the community uh, connect that you will be able to create through that constant interaction with those kids, the parents, uh, the, the 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 neighborhood is something that essentially is going to help you uh, in in the long term business also. Yeah, the, the, the only issue in this, I, I don't think a lot of uh, industries will be in that because up to people like you to then sell the idea. They will. They will. Yeah. Uh, Varun, they will because I think uh, uh, what I've realized, uh, I told you right. In, uh, maybe that was before you came in. 2010 was when business was a bad word in world of football. Uh, we wanted to give it a shot, and we created certain businesses, and then there are multiple other. And they do support. They do support if if done the right way. Uh, so again, uh, similarly, I think if if you are looking at the other aspects which are right now new to our country, but somewhere or the other we have the opportunity to take inspiration from a Brazil. From a from a UK from from major league soccer for that matter, what what US is doing is fascinating. I think that's a lot more relevant to us as compared to a, uh, a Europe or 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 a, or a South America. So, yeah. So, sir, I hope I'm I'm, I'm able to kind of uh, clarify certain things. But then I would definitely would want to uh, get a lot more feedback from you. League, as I said, uh, league definitely very very important because it's it's pretty much the showcase. Okay, this was because you're still awake, not slept off. <laughs> yeah, give me another 15 minutes. Okay, we'll talk football. Okay, so so uh, league is the showpiece. You build a nice cake. You you bake a nice cake which has youth development, grassroots, communities. You have the commercial. You have the business side of it and everything. And league is something like a cherry on top of that cake. It's a showcase. It's 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 the showpiece that definitely needs to. Create that bit of sense of confidence. Create that bit of sense of engagement. And ultimately, sir, I would like to state that footballers are also artists. They need recognition. They need to exhibit their talents. So this is what the league does to uh, the football. Now, where are we uh, on that right now? And it's a very, very controversial topic. And uh, I'm happy that there's a lot of discussion that's kind of going on around that. Uh, it's, it's pretty much a tussle between what the ambitions of the new owners of ISL, as well as the traditional powerhouses, uh, clubs like East Bengal, Mohan Bagan, or whatever it might be. But my belief is the 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 Indian Super League. Uh, I I might be completely off, but the Indian Super League has a little more of futuristic point of view. That's the reason. If you even if you see the migration of a Bengaluru FC, which by far was uh, an ideal club from all points of view. Is migrating towards the Indian Super League. Uh, Mohan Bagan is Bengal also. Some sooner or later, I do believe will will kind of go go through that migration. Uh, so somewhere or the other, I do believe Indian Super League might be the league that will become the key showpiece for for the country. And and they've so far they've done uh, the the things that uh, are working for everybody involved. There are a lot of learnings. There are a lot of scope of development that definitely uh, needs to be addressed. But having said that, it definitely is a shade, or maybe a couple of shades better than what I League was. So what do we have right now? Uh, from a from a development point of view, we still have I League as pretty much the top league and the traditional powerhouses like Mohan Bagan, East Bengal, who still get in a lakh people uh, when they play the derby. Uh, and and uh, comparing that to the Indian Super League, definitely well packaged, high profile. Uh, there are new investors who essentially are looking at newer ideas. Uh, and and uh, these investors definitely have a larger scope of of investing uh, in in what they want to kind of do. So I I do believe this is a situation. Let's see how it kind of goes. My expectation in next ten years essentially is that if second division, which is a lower tier, if first division, which is a second tier, and the Indian Super League, all these leagues have minimum twenty teams each, offering employment, offering. Uh, uh, year-round football programming, offering year-round commitment onto the grassroots. Uh, they, they, they need to exist uh, in the next uh, uh, 10 years or so. We, uh, that that def definitely is a desire that I believe is practically possible. Indian Super League at least having about 20 teams and 20, yes. So can I just say you just going forward with this, I think you are the right to express themselves in the club. Eyes up at this point for I League. Yes. I'm not allowed to be able to go into the Super League because so we've got to have a structure where the leaders or the winners go in. We can't have a, a situation where it's just 
no relegation, no promotion, because that would just stagnate the whole as I said, as I said, um, I think it's a very, very controversial uh, uh, discussion right now, and um, I still nobody has been able to find uh, the, the right answer so far. Uh, and in your right, uh, where maybe the Isol case study uh, didn't get the right kind of respect, what it should. Leicester, and while apparently you had you had a Leicester kind of story that was happening in English Premier League. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So, so th th there are certain situations which definitely are very, very unique to our country. You know, when the logic which has been drawn of that, I'm really unsupported. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> 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 sir, sir, okay. So, my belief is there, there are new experiments that are required, definitely. You, you, uh, you cannot just kind of, uh, if, uh, think about it, a situation where uh, India, and BCCI were the strongest opponent of, if you remember, IPL. And what that billion dollar baby has become today, after 10 years, imagine BCCI was the most vocal organization against a concept of T20. The experiment happened, and it happened over a period of 10 years. Again, when we come back again meet and meet in 2027, uh, I don't know where things would be. Uh, I see. Uh, and uh, they basically killed those guys right. by not allowing the Pakistan players and all those guys to play. So they didn't start the concept by themselves. Right. So right. Yeah, and the BCCI concept was already done by three, but unfortunately, BCCI still killed the team. Agreed. So, I mean, th those are the larger level politics. But again, I get excited about this discussion be because people care. So th there is some bit of involvement in, in the ent entire discussion. Having said that, anyways, yes, ma'am. Right, man. If you're saying that at the age of 16, do they have any any experience uh, playing for better in the future? How do you get them to play education? Because I think that is a big factor in that age. Yes, man. They are into the camps and all that. Yes. What are you thinking of getting them to combine both? Or well, you just, uh, I can just talk about my academy right now. I definitely can't enforce my philosophy onto anybody. Education for me is supremely important, man. Education and not really the academic and the schooling side of it, but the real education awareness, what, what a kid needs to kind of go through, is actually going to help him to become a better player. Yeah, uh, yeah but the balance between the, at that age right. is very important right. for the Indian system of education. Right. You have to get them going into the camps and all that. Right. How do you support them? I mean, they can eat this system. You're they right, ma'am. They can carry on with the football. Ma'am, so you're not teaching the other side. No, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. I think it's very, very, uh, I mean, if you have that interest, I definitely would want to go a little deeper into it. Last uh, 15 days, I've been talking to a family in Punjab, uh, and uh, their kid, uh, he's, he's uh, in 10th grade uh, in, in our academy. And uh, the kid is a kid. He definitely believes that he needs to take it easy, go to the open schooling, write exam once in a, in a, in a year, and that's, again, a possible uh, option that you have. My insistence is on the extreme side. I'm actually telling him that give it a shot. You have it in you. You, you are a good student. Why don't you kind of regularly go to a school and, and make sure that it's not only the uh, 25 players that you're interacting with uh, on the pitch every day, but it's also a larger community of 500 students, teachers, and all that. That's going to help your personality to do a lot better. Plus, academics, when you are learning things in a structured environment, it gets you thinking. It gets you uh, to organize your thoughts. And that is something that a player also needs on the pitch. And I do believe Jaskaran Singh, if he goes to school regularly, will become a better player, provided he obviously is able to balance it out. What do we do to balance it out? He is a tired player. After 6 o'clock, after his training is done, I mean, uh, to expect him to just go out and kind of motivate himself to do the lessons for the next day, definitely difficult. So what we are trying to do is bring in some tutors who essentially is going to help him out. Then there would be a bigger question in terms of what happens during the examination time. I still believe that if, if there could be a good balance that could be cracked, in, uh, and that's the reason we were meeting the principal of the school, just to make them understand that please help me to make my player better through a very important virtue like academics. And they definitely are understanding. Uh, while equally concerned, they are about their 100% results, because you know getting in a kid at 
you know, in, in 10th grade and, you know, seeing him fail is a concern that they have uh, about their record. So, ma'am, that's the balance that we're trying to create. Another very important thing, which is more on the skill development. The chances are there, if I'm training 100 kids uh, over a period of next four years, only will uh, two will make it, Ma one maybe on a lucky day. What happens to those 98, 95 kids? My hope is that they have enough of that academic, uh, you know, capability in them to look out for certain options. Alongside, if we can develop certain other skills, we are trying to analyze their personalities in terms of what are their hobbies, what are their interests. I don't want them to just kind of know only social studies or or any regular subject. If there is uh, some bit of affinity or some bit of passion towards art, music, uh, physiotherapy, coaching, refereeing, I, I want to give them some bit of flavor in next four years so that after four years, if they are stuck and then really hitting a wall, they have something to fall back upon. So that that's pretty much what, what we are trying to attempt. But again, going back, learning is what I believe should be the stress till about 12 years. So again, uh, the gentleman obviously was so <laughs> kind of, but I, I, I like that bit of passion. I, I, and that, that's what I've experienced in, uh, in, in, in Goa. Uh, and and uh, But again, I, I don't know, but my expectation is next 10 years, if ISL, I-League, second division, even the state leagues could become better, much more organized, just offer weekend matches every week uh, to, to all the players, uh, get employment for the coaches, get employment for the referees, get employment for the professionals who are associated. And that's how the industry is going to grow. We are not going to grow the industry if the I-League player today for three months plays for a Calcutta club and then goes out and plays for a Goa club. Is the same player being kind of rotated and we are not going to see any increase in the quality. Uh, we, we spoke enough about it, so I'm not going to kind of really uh, repeat that. Uh, but from a worst ever ranking uh, for the national team in uh, one, 171 uh, rank uh, to a top, top 100 and hoping that 6th of July uh, brings in a lot more cheer. 50 is my expectation, sir. Say 50 is my expectation and top 8 is my ambition. Um, I, I hope it happens and I hope there are enough uh, uh, people to support this particular cause that we have. Uh, are we okay so far? Uh, this brings me to the last slide, and which is a lot more on expertise that you have rather than me. So I, 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 I will be looking at a lot more uh, interactions on your side. But so far, are we, are we okay? Goa, I, I've told you my love affair with Goa uh, when, when I kind of uh, came in and uh, a brand like FC Goa that uh, definitely kind of enlightened me um, in, a, in a great way. Uh, plus, uh, my experiences um, of visiting small little villages, picking up games on the beach, and then learning a lot more has been fascinating. Uh, that's the reason now that uh, Goa is home, uh, I have a big, big concern. Uh, we are losing the plot. 2007, I remember Mahesh Gavli, Climax Lawrence, Clifford Miranda, uh, Denzil played for the country at one point of time. Uh, uh, then, then there was time when Romeo, Mandar, obviously, were giving the regular. Francis Fernandez went down and played. Uh, so, from from a situation where in the Asian Cup uh, campaign we had about five players playing in the first eleven, five players playing in the first eleven from Goa, uh, we are at one. Raulin Bauges getting a regular start, and one Puljanso Cardozo sitting on the bench. I'm scared. Uh, it's it's not not a great great uh, situation to be in. Uh, even from building aspirations for the younger generation, uh, making sure that they are at least aware about, you know, a lot of possibilities that could happen to a golden kid and a golden player and everything and all. So something's not kind of working out well. Come down to the women's team. I've seen so many good women players. Is it good to see Croatia in the dark at the moment? Because the monsoons, we've got the clouds for three weeks. Right. How are we ever going to develop kids when we've had to stop for three months? And B, we've tried to get for exhibitions, these children, in order to get to where we've got to get to. It's a 12-month program. I, I, think, I think these are the solutions I get excited about. Problems is something that we all know. I, I think these are the solutions we get excited about. In fact, yesterday, again, my, my whole insistence to Goa is you, you've created an organization to develop football at grassroots level. It's called GFDC, a fantastic idea. But do we have a policy? Do, do we have a unifying vision to go out and tell GFA, this is what we want to achieve in 2022? 
go out and tell GFDC produce so many players so that at least I have representation in under 17, uh, this thing. I, I think we are, we are working in silos. Uh, do we go to a de uh, department of youth affairs and sports who is responsible for school sports to go out and say let the competition uh, happen in a way where the GFA, the Goa Football Association is involved. I don't think those, uh, think those conversations are happening.